Good morning. You guys ready to get into Word of God? Yeah, all right. Let's get our Bibles open, please. Turn them into the Gospel of Mark. That is where we've been going as a church verse by verse, in case you didn't know that. Mark chapter 11. We're going to be finishing this chapter. And uh, as you were making your way there, I want, to, I want to highlight something that I'm so encouraged by, so blessed by in recent weeks. Uh, and that is how much more and more of our people of our Church of Salvation Church that I have been personally seeing and hearing that we're getting into the Word of God, that we're learning it, we're reading it, we're studying it, we're memorizing it, we're using it to share the gospel it, with people, we're using it to defend the, the faith that was once for all passed down uh, from maybe false teachings out there. Like, I've been so encouraged. So let me sh share with you just a few examples of what I've seen. So uh, Josiah, who was just up here doing the announcements, he leads our young adult ministry. And I love this. In recent weeks, I, he sent me a video of himself practicing explaining in the Word of God the difference between saving faith that produces works in James and other passages compared to the, uh, in Romans where it says that we're saved by faith alone, not by works. How do those things play? And I love it. Like he's been studying those things. He sent me a video of himself explaining it because he's trying to learn why. Because this is a common topic that people bring up from other false religions and so forth out there. And uh, by the way, if you, uh, if you want to learn more about the difference of those, we're literally going to be addressing those in the next apologetic session when we keep talk, continue to talk about Roman Catholicism and what they teach. We're going to be talking about what is saving faith, but faith alone, how does that all play together? But I was so encouraged when Josiah sent me that video of himself learning these things and practicing these things. Uh, then I was so, I've been so blessed, even just in my own DX group, because that's the guys I'm with, but I'm, I know what's happening in the other DX groups. But I love it when I hear these guys who are we're working on quoting verses by memory in our DX groups. I love it when I hear other people who are writing the word of God on their hearts. It's, it's so encouraging to me. Well, I love it when I think about last weekend when we had the last apologetic session. And we have Brian, uh, who's our church planting resident, and, and all the work that he put in to present uh, the teachings of the Word of God and then also the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church and to compare those together and, and to see him up there doing that, that, that inspires me and encourages me how much he got into the Word of God. It encourages me, too, to think about how many people were in the room at the apologetic session the last time, like, again, a week ago. Uh, in fact, someone who's newer in our church was like, you know, so impressed and encouraged themselves by the percentage of the size of our church from how many people were in the room that night. And to think, wow, there's this many people who are, who are sacrificing two hours of a Saturday to learn the Word of God, to learn what Roman Catholicism teaches, and to learn how we can share with those that we love that are in Roman Catholicism. It encourages me. By the way, if you want to come to the next one, it's going to be in November. So plan to come. And then just this last week, I was blessed and inspired and encouraged when we were meeting with a few of us and, and Matt, our worship leader, was there. And we're talking about a number of different things. And within 15 minutes, uh, he's quoting two to three different verses on completely different subjects that we happen to be bouncing around on. He's throwing this verse, throwing that verse, throwing that verse. And then next thing you know, we're talking about how Jesus is built fully God, fully man. He's like, yeah, the hypostatic union. And finally, I just stopped. After you quoted so many verses, he's throwing out the theological phrase of hypostatic union. And I just said, Matt, I am so proud of you, man. And he's like, I know I've been learning and I've been studying and I, you know what I mean? Like, and so I just want to say this. I'm so encouraged by how many more and more of us are getting the word of God in our hands. And so I'm going to share with you something before we move on here, um, and, and don't take it the wrong way. By the end, you'll see what I'm saying, okay? So I've been walking with Jesus now since I was five years old. That's a long time because I'm old. And um, I've been reading the Bible. I've been learning it in church all my life. And, and by the time I was 16 years old, I went on a two-month mission trip. And in those two months, our whole team, we studied and we memorized 40 verses alone in just one summer of my life. I mean, I don't know how many verses I have memorized now, but I have quite a few memorized in my life. 
I continue to, to study and read and so forth. By the time I get to college, I spend four years learning the Bible and get a Christian ministries degree. Then I become a full-time pastor. I've been a full-time pastor for 21 years. In the middle of all those years, I go back, I get three more years of my Master of Divinity, continuing to study the scriptures. And then every day of my life, and I'm not exaggerating, every day of my life, I'm reading the Word of God. I'm either memorizing a new verse or re-memorizing one, because if you don't use it, you what? lose it. And um, I'm watching YouTube videos of people sharing the gospel. I'm using, watching YouTube videos of people teaching the word of God, etc. Here's what I'm trying to say. This is nothing about patting myself on the back. Here's why I say all of that. I continue to need to learn the Bible. Even with all that I know, I, I don't know enough, if that makes sense. And, and Jesus says that I, that I need to always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks me for a reason for the hope that is in me with gentleness and respect. And that is what I continue to do. So what I'm trying to say is that I, this is a, all of an intro to make sure you have a Bible open your, in your hands, in your lap right now, or you have it on the phone right now. Because guys, the Word of God is living and active. It can change our lives. Lives. It can set us on fire for Jesus Christ. It is the truth that can set people free. And the question is, do we know it to be able to share it with other people? And so I've been so encouraged to see so many people more and more getting into the Word of God. And every time we get together, this is a church that, yes, I could easily uh, do all these sermons and, and not in any way, shape, or form expect or encourage or, 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 or try to get people to open your Bibles. I can do that. But that's not really serving anybody. The best thing I can do is to not just give you a fish, but teach you how to fish. The best thing I can do is to encourage, inspire, and teach you how to get the Bible open in your own hands. And so with all that said, that's quite an intro. And we're going to now get into the Word of God and look at Mark chapter 11. Let's continue on in the context. Verse 27 says, And they, that's Jesus and the disciples, they came again to Jerusalem. Okay, so they're coming back to Jerusalem. So let's remember what's all going on in this time, because some of us, weren't, we haven't been here lately. If you're a first-time visitor, I mean it. We're really, really glad that you're here. Um, but let me catch us up to speed. What's going on is this is the middle of a week of Jesus' life, literally the last week before he dies on the cross. It's what we call the Passion Week. Maybe you've heard of that before. Lots of events are going on. Jesus is in Jerusalem. He's actually staying in a suburb and he goes back and forth every day into the city. And so it starts that he's been in Jerusalem since Sunday. And now on the Sunday, he rode into the city riding on the colt of a what? Help me out. Okay, that was, oh man, you guys were with me earlier, but let's try it again. Okay, so, so Jesus is riding on the colt of a what? of a donkey uh, into the city as a parade. Thousands of people are there and they're hailing him as the king, uh, but he's coming as the humble king, not riding on a, on a white horse of conquering. He's coming in on the colt of a donkey, which is a young donkey, because he's the humble king who's on his way to die days later, basically a week later for the sins of the world. But why would he die on the sin, for the sins of the world? Because he, if he didn't, you and I couldn't get into the kingdom. You see, he is the king, there's no question. But we couldn't get into the kingdom unless he died for us to be able to get into the kingdom. So praise God. So that's what happens on Sunday. Well then, and you think about it, the whole city is talking about Jesus because this is like a massive parade. Well then Monday, what happens Monday? So Monday, he's walking back into the city and he walks by what kind of tree and he curses it? What kind? A fig tree, very good, a fig tree. And he curses it. In, as he goes into the city. Then he goes up to the temple and he's overthrowing what? Tables, right? So now he's overthrowing the tables because there's ex extortion going on. This, again, was a massive event. This is on, on Monday. No one has ever done this in the temple courts. No one would ever dare to do something like that in the temple courts. Everybody would have been talking about it. And Jesus does that. And, and so now here we are on Tuesday. As we've been going through Mark chapter 11, we've already learned early in the morning on Tuesday already, he goes back walking up from the suburb into the city and they saw the fig tree. Now it's 24 hours after he cursed it. It's completely dead to its roots. And um, if you missed all of those teachings and what that means, watch the sermons from the last so many weeks. Um, but that's what we covered. Now, now here we are today in Mark 11:27. 27. 
This is 24 hours after Jesus has thrown the temples and, you know, temple courts. He's thrown the, ta the table, sorry, in the temple. He's cleared it out 24 hours later. Think about what you did 24 hours ago. You know, what was that? Saturday morning, right? So that's, that's the time frame. 24 hours after he did this, he's going back into the temple courts. Now, right there, already, I'm going to throw out an application for every one of us here today. Here it is. Are you ready? Be as bold as Jesus. You and I as God's people, we need to be as bold as Jesus. You're like, where do you get that in the text? We've only, <laughs> all we've read so far is that Jesus came again to Jerusalem. And we're already getting an application. He, let me help connect the dots. Jesus, again, is going not just into Jerusalem. He's going to go to the temple courts. You're going to see that in just a minute. 24 hours after he just threw the tables and caused everybody to go, and he knows that the Jewish religious leaders are there. He knows that these guys hate him. They want to kill him. So he, but he, instead of avoiding the temple court after the scene that he did, 24 hours later, he's choosing to go right back to the temple courts to, to where it's all happening. See, Jesus was extremely bold. Jesus was a man's man. Jesus was never in the Bible ever recorded as being afraid of something or someone. Jesus was as bold as they get. And when you think about this, get this. If you think about it, Jesus is God. And, and, and when you think, well, for us as Christians, if you've grown up in the church, you might know this. What's one of the main passages that we quote, maybe we memorize it, we quote it to tell ourselves to like, be bold, be courageous. There's some good classic kid songs. I might start breaking out and singing. It's not my plan, but I might just because it's like ingrained in my head. But like, remember this from what, what, who was a person getting ready to go into the promised land and face all these enemies and God was telling them to be bold and courageous. Who, who was that? Anybody remember? Joshua, right? Joshua. Joshua 1, 9. Be bold. Be courageous. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. For the Lord your God. Anyway, I'm going to break on song. I'm going to stop. But the point is, um, this, get this. Jesus ultimately is the one who told him that because Jesus is God. Jesus is the God who told Joshua hundreds of years before, be bold, be courageous. This is Jesus. Now he's going into his own battle, if you will. He's going into the temple courts 24 hours later. He is the most bold, courageous man who's ever walked the face of the planet as he's walking back in there. You see, Jesus' Jesus' own enemies actually knew that Jesus was not afraid. They knew that he didn't care what people thought of him or what they would do to him. Listen to what his own enemies said in Matthew twenty two sixteen. 16. They said, teacher, we know that you are true and that you teach the way of God truthfully. And here it is. And you do not care about anyone's opinion of you for you are not swayed by appearances. Even his own enemy saw the courage, the resoluteness, the, the, the fire, the boldness that Jesus had. Now here's the thing. Jesus still today is calling you and me as Christians to be bold, just like he is. And this culminates as he gave us the great commission in Matthew 28. And the last part of that is verse 20, when he says, behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. What's he saying? He's saying, I'm sending you out to go make disciples of all nations. And there's going to be some hard times. And there's going to be some dangerous times. And there's going to be times that you're going to be afraid of what people think of you, etc. But don't worry, I'm going to be with you. Be bold. Jesus is our model and our example of someone who was courageous and bold. So brothers and sisters, are we being bold for Jesus in our life? Or, are we, or, or, or on the flip side, are we worried about what people think of us? And so we stay quiet or we don't stand up for him or we don't share the gospel maybe when the spirit of God's impressing it on our hearts because we're not being bold. Let's, let's have Jesus be our model. Uh, I, I'm so encouraged when I heard about recently one of the teen guys in our youth group. And uh, he, he was sharing with me this, this, this story that happened. He goes to public school. He's in a classroom and he overhears some 
classmate girls behind him. And the classmate girls are talking about a friend of theirs that's not in the room and how their friend had recently been what they called born again, got saved and gave their life to Jesus. And they were making fun of, they were making fun of their friend for becoming a Christian. And he's hearing it. At that moment, he sensed the Spirit tell him, stand up for her and stand up for me. Stand up for the gospel and say something. And so he prayed under his breath. He got up and he said to the girls, like, hey, that's not really nice of you to be making fun of uh, your friend that's not even here and for becoming a Christian. There's nothing funny about becoming a Christian. It's, it's like it's an important thing. And he stood up for her, this girl he's never even met. He stood up for the Lord and, and the girls began to talk back and, you know, well, whatever, you, you know, just kind of give him a hard time. And, and there was so much commotion about it that then another girl somewhere else in the room overhears it. She's even more volatile than the other two. And it comes where she's like got a bottle of water. She starts throwing it onto this, this teenage guy in our church, you know, goes to our church here and starts throwing the water on him and, and he's just standing up for the Lord, standing up for this sister in Christ. He doesn't even know yet. And, and here's what, it all ends finally, class is done and, and he shares the story. And that was cool is that these girls basically now leave him alone because I've learned this, that 90% of the time when you stand up in boldness and courage, that eventually people will leave you alone because they're not used to someone actually standing up with boldness and courage right? And, and, and so I'm just so proud to hear how this teenage guy was willing to do that. That's the kind of thing Jesus would do. That's what we're seeing Jesus do here. He's going right back into the, the den, and he doesn't care because he's a man of courage. And so brothers and sisters in Christ, next time that we're sensing the Holy Spirit telling us to stand up, to speak up with a neighbor, with a co-worker, with a classmate at school, with a family member, we do it with love, we do it with gentleness and respect, but we are to be bold and ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. I'm telling you, you will get shocked how much he can fill you. Shocked how much he can change you. Shocked how much courage he can give you. Ask him and he'll do it for his glory. And just watch what God does. Watch what God does. Amen? Amen. Amen. So be bold as Jesus, okay? We got through half a verse. This is great. Okay, let's go on though. So Mark 127, we got a couple more applications out of this. Uh, let's go on. So as Jesus, so he's at the temple courts, as he was walking in the temple. So he's walking around. You picture the temple courts. He's walking around the temple courts 24 hours after he just cleared it. He knows the religious leaders are there. Now, Matthew and Luke, they record the same event. And what they say is that not only was he walking, but he was sharing the gospel message and teaching the word of God as he was walking around. So he's walking around, he's telling people, you guys need to believe. Believe I am the Messiah, put your faith in me, repent. The kingdom of God is at hand, wrath is coming, avoid it, you know, et cetera, et cetera. He's teaching all these things, he's walking around in the temple courts. And then what does it say? It says, Oh man, here we go. Who comes up? The chief priest and the scribes and the elders came to him. These are three of, of, of most of the Jewish religious leading groups, and they are now ready to deal with him. And they are furious. Again, remember back when he threw the tables in verse 18 of the same chapter, it says the chief priests and the scribes, they heard that he had cleared the temple and they were seeking a way to destroy him to destroy him, but they feared him because of the crowd was all astonished at their teaching. So in other words, the crowd was holding back these guys. If the crowd wasn't so much into Jesus, they would have killed him already. So these guys come up to Jesus. They are raging mad that he would do that to the temple course. Look at verse 28. And they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do them? So to do what? What things are they referring to? Well, one of them would be, who gave you the authority to walk into the temple courts and start preaching the things of God in this temple? This is our temple. We didn't give you permission to walk around here and preach and teach and so forth. And of course, they would be referring to 24 hours earlier, the day before, who gave you the right, who gave you the permission to overthrow the temple tables and to make a mess of things? In other words, again, who gave you the right is what they're saying to him. Who gives you the right? It's a great question. 
But you see, when you study the Bible, Jesus um, never once asked anybody for permission to say anything or do anything. There's no verse that says he ever asked someone permission. You'll never find a verse then that you hear him say to the Jewish religious leaders to ask them for permission to teach something, to heal somebody, to do something. He never asked for permission from anybody, any man. And so this is three years that Jesus has been teaching and doing miracles and so forth. And there has been a clash between, between him and the Jewish religious leaders for three years where they, they can't stand because he's teaching things they don't like. He's doing things that don't fit their theology. He's not asking them for the authority and the permission to do these things. In Mark alone, chapters, Mark chapter 2, Mark chapter 3, chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 10, chapter 14, all record uh, these conflicts between Jesus and the authorities of his day and how they, they were going after him. And so now when you have 24 hours before this, Jesus cleaning the temple, I mean, this was just over the top to them. And they, they are now, they are clearly in Matthew 26, it's recorded, they are, they are accusing him of blasphemy. And they are saying that someone who does blasphemy is rejecting God's authority in their life. It is someone who is implying that they are God themselves, and therefore they have God authority to do and to say what they want to say. They are accusing him of blasphemy. And here's the reality. Jesus was either blasphemous and the crucifixion was right for him as a blasphemer. Or he is God himself in the flesh incarnated who has all authority because he is God. That's the two options we have. I'll say it again. So either Jesus was blasphemous or he is God with all God authority. And so I'll stand here very clearly and, and say, of course, you know, as Christianity this is what we're saying. Jesus was and is, still is. He is God. And he was God when he was on this planet with all authority that God would have. Now here's something a lot of people don't understand. Although he is God, when he came from heaven 2,000 years ago and he came into this world, he laid down a lot of his authority. He laid down a lot of his uh, abilities as being God. Let me, let me share with you one of the passages that tells us this in Philippians chapter 2. In verse 5, it says, Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped. In other words, he is God. He comes and takes a human body in what we call the incarnation. But even though he is God, he laid down, he didn't grasp and take hold of a lot of his divine attributes and qualities and abilities and his authority, okay? He lays it down, verse seven, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Let me tell you why Jesus did this. Because this is the only way for your sins and for my sins to ever be forgiven. Is that God needed to come and become a man so that then he could die on the cross on our behalf. So that then he could raise from the dead so that he can give us forgiveness. So praise be to God that Jesus chose to come and lay down his authority, to lay down his attributes as being God, to become like one of us, to die the cross that we deserve to die so that he can give us forgiveness. Can I get an amen from brothers and sisters? Amen. amen. This, is, this, is, this is what Jesus did for us. Praise God. But here's the thing. Even though he laid down a lot of things, the father, while he was here, then gave him authority. He gave him divine authority. He gave him all the, the authority of the father he gave to Jesus while he was here. Let me share with you a number of verses that talk about this. John chapter 5. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, the son does likewise. But then you go to verse 26, 27. For as the father has life in himself, that's talking about giving someone eternal life. So he has granted the son also to have life in himself. And here it is. And the father has given Jesus, what word? authority. You hear that? He has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. Well, Matthew 11, 27, all things, all things, Jesus says, have been handed over to me by my father. 
And no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. You hear that all authority, all things have been handed down to Him. John 3.35, the Father loves the Son and has given Him all things into His hand. You hear that? All things, that's all authority into Jesus' hands by the Father. In John chapter 17, Jesus' prayer right before He goes to the cross, it says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven. He said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. And then here it is. Since you have given him what? Sorry. Authority over all flesh to give eternal life to whom you have given him. And then after the resurrection, before he goes back to heaven, he gives us the great commission. But here's how he starts it off in Matthew 28, 18. All authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. You hear how Jesus, even though he laid down, he still had all divine authority because the Father gave it to him, even in that state of being here 2,000 years ago. He had all authority. The Jewish leaders, and really the majority of the Jewish people of his day, though, they rejected Jesus as being God with all authority in their life, to speak into their life, to tell them how to live their lives. Instead, they wanted to continue to live their lives by their standards, in the ways that they wanted to, not to look at Jesus as the king of all kings and listen to what he has to say. You see, guys, this is a lot like today. It really has always been. But it is, it's a lot like today. People don't like to be told what to do and not do, right? Let's just be honest. And in all of us, in our sin, this is what we're like. We want the authority. We want the right to do what we want to do. Uh, a few of uh, some of us in our church and some other Christians, we, we got uh, a few days ago, a couple days ago, we were meeting with a, a group of, of uh, students at UNF and a uh, you know, number of non-Christians and and, and I was just trying to explain this to them in all love and everything. It's just like, listen, what moral code and standard are we living our lives by? And I love it that one, at least one of them to the side of me finally said, you know, I was like, who decides what standards we live by? And I love it. She was finally getting it and she was honest. She's like, society does. I'm like, you're exactly right. Society does. Individually, we do it. Society as a whole, we, we do it. But the question is, Where's God in all of it? And should we not be living by God's standard, not what society says? Of course, I even in love said to her, you know, in all of them, I said, so, but is that how it should be? Because uh, the society of the Nazis in, Ger in Germany in, in World War II said that certain things were right. Do you think that's always the right standard? They're like, no, you're right. So where do we get our standards? But see, this is, this is, the, this is our moral dilemma as, as humans. We want to do what we want to do. We want to decide. We don't like it when someone else tells us what to do and not do. And so the, I'm going to tell you, this is today's day and age, if you will. This is the ultimate unwritten but said all the time standard. Society says this, do whatever you want. Follow your heart. Do whatever you want as long as what? You're happy and it doesn't hurt Anybody else? That's the God of the sage. That's the standard by which it was said in our meeting, three hours of talking about the gospel and all these things with that group. That was by far the overall thing. And let me just say this. I'm going to say this in love. I'm just going to say it, is that even that though has glaring hypocrisy in our, in our culture. And it's not just ours around a lot, a lot of parts of the world. Because we want to do whatever we want to do as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else. And yet I'm going to con continue to kill preborn people to get what I want to do. But then, oh wait, that conflicts with our, our standard. We don't hurt anybody else, so let's dehumanize them and they're not even people now. And now we can do whatever we want to do because having a baby is going to mess up what I want to do. Let's say this in love. But it's true. It's a glaring hypocrisy of the standard by our society. Let's do what we want to do as long as we don't hurt anybody else. And yet... That's what abortion is. It is hurting somebody else to the worst degree. Every time I want to talk about abortion, I want to say this 
If you've ever been part, participating in that, there is no sin that the Lord cannot forgive. If you give that to him, you ask him to forgive you, he can forgive you. I know a number of people that have done that and they ask for the Lord for forgiveness, he has forgiven them, okay? But when we're talking about, well, I'm gonna do what I wanna do, as long as it's not hurt anybody else, abortion is a glaring hypocrisy in all that. And again, that's why they go to dehumanize because then it's so they can fit it into their little worldview. And, and so, but let me say this, this is the root of all sin, guys. The root of sin is rebellion against the king of his authority to speak into my life. I want to do what I want to do, as long as it doesn't hurt me else, except for this. You know, you know what I mean? But like, the last thing I want to do is to submit myself to the things of God. See, this is why, this is why there's certain subjects in society now that are getting Christians in a lot of trouble. It, it, what gets us in trouble is when we talk about certain things like homosexuality, gender fluidity, drunkenness, getting high, certain things like that, where it doesn't directly hurt anybody. And yet we say that King Jesus says they're wrong and they go, well, that doesn't match our, just not hurting anybody. How dare you say that it's wrong because it's not hurting anybody because that's the standard of the authority they live by. It's what gets us in trouble. So they say, why not? Here's why not. Let me answer your question. Why not? Because God says why not to do it. That's why. Because he is the supreme authority. Jesus says, King Jesus says, don't do these things because he has the authority to define morality. And so the question really is, who are we going to live? In? Who are we going to live for? But let me just say this really clearly. Listen, every one of us are going to die. And we're not just going to die. We're going to stand before God, the judge. And we're going to be judged, not on our standards of our society. We're going to be judged by his standard, by his authority. And the Bible says that we're already born into sin. It's not going to go well for us. We are guilty many, many times over. And we deserve hell and separation from God forever. But it's coming, I'm telling you. I share, we shared this a couple days ago, right? With a whole group there at the campus. But then I also went on. I said, let me share with you the good news though. Jesus, when he came 2,000 years ago, he lived the moral perfect life that none of us can live. And he died on the cross and paid the price for us to be able to be forgiven. But to receive that free gift, here's what we have to do. What do we have to do? We got to believe everything I've just said, the gospel, but we have to say, please forgive me, Jesus. I've been living according to my own authority, according to my own standards. And from now on, I'm going to submit to you as the king of my life. From now on, I'm going to learn in the scriptures how to live under your authority. That's, that's what repentance is. So, for some in the room, maybe online, here's your application. Surrender your life to King Jesus. Surrender your life to Jesus as the king of your life. Some of you might say, well, I've always believed in Christianity and that Jesus existed and he died. That's great. That's great. And that's good. It's necessary, but it's still not enough. We have to repent. We have to say and admit up until whatever day, this day that I'm praying to you right now, God, I have been living according to my own standards by my own authority. Please forgive me. This day on, I submit to your authority in my life. So when did you do that? And I plead with you. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. I mean, I know about a 17-year-old guy from the last church I served that just died last week. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. Give your life to Jesus Christ. If you want to talk to us, we're going to be praying during the closing song at the end. But let me say this then. Also, brothers and sisters in Christ. Praise God. There was that day. We can all remember it, right? We remember when we prayed, when we surrendered and repented and believed and we got born again. Praise God. He is our king, but now here's the part of it. Even though he is our king overall, he now, through the rest of our life in this thing called sanctification, he is finding areas of our life that we are still holding on to that we need to surrender to him. So the question is, is there something in our life that is a stronghold that we're holding on to, even though Jesus is our king, 
that we need to give to him? Is there something that we need to own and say, Jesus, please forgive me. You know, this area of my life, I get angry to, to unrighteous, sinful anger way too quick, way too much. Please forgive me, Lord, help me. I'm surrendering this to you. Help change me by your Holy Spirit, you see? And so what are those things in our life? Whatever they are, continue to continue, continue to humble ourselves and surrender those things to King Jesus and let him more and more reign in us, okay? So surrender your life to King Jesus. Let's go on. We're gonna read the rest of the passage. We're gonna learn one more thing today before we're done. You guys still with me? If you are, say amen. Amen? All right, here we go. Verse 29, Jesus then says to them, oh, this gets good. This gets good. Jesus says to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. And so they discussed it with one another, saying, if we say from heaven... He will say, well, then why then didn't you believe him? But if we, say, if we shall say from man, they were afraid of the people, for they held that John was really a prophet. And so they answered Jesus, we do not know. And Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. You see, this was extremely brilliant of Jesus, which is what you expect if he's God. He's pretty brilliant. But he's brilliant because he's done, he, he, he at this point now, he knows he's about to die on the cross because Passover is coming and he knows from the father, it's time. He knows it's coming. He's done dealing with these guys. Three years of them being stiff necked, arrogant, proud, rejecting, arguing, not being willing to submit to his authority. And now he is ready to shut them up for good. And that's what he did. Because when he says, it was John the Baptist from God or from man, which means not God, he knew that they would be stuck. Because if they say that he's from God, get this, then they would actually connect the dots and have to say, well, then we need to worship you, Jesus, because you are the Messiah that John was saying. <laughs> so they don't, want to, they don't want to say John was a prophet because then they got to actually, like, instead of arguing and fighting with him, get on their knees before him. Now, if they were humble, they would have, but they're not humble. They're proud. They can't admit they're wrong. Go the other way. They say that John is from man, which means not from God. Well, they don't like that because the, a lot of crowd did think that John was a prophet and they liked the, the praise of men in their pride. And so they don't want to say that because now a lot of people aren't going to like them, even maybe even hurt them, you know, depending what crowd it was and what they thought. But the point is, they didn't like that option. And so these very proud men in their, ha in their pride are actually forced in their own pride, if that makes sense, to say something that would, was so funny, but like, we don't know. We don't know. Trying to get out of it. But here's the reality. These guys lied when they said that. They knew. They knew that John was a prophet. They knew the truth and they, in their pride and their sin, they just didn't want to submit to Jesus as king. Uh, Augustine was a pastor back in the 400s AD. Augustine reminds us as he was studying this passage of a time when Jesus said, knock and it will be open to you. And when he was reading this, he was saying this, that not only did these, these Jewish religious leaders not open the door, they barricaded the door by their answer when they lied through their teeth. They barricaded the door from letting King Jesus come and reign inside of them on this day. And so Jesus returns, says, well, I'm gonna stop knocking then. That's what's going on here. He's done helping them because they don't want him to help them. And so in other words, Jesus is the king and Jesus, the king, shuts them up for good. Now, I said we have one more point I think that we can get out of this. Once you and I submit ourselves to King Jesus through the gospel, we're, we're Christians, what do we do now? Well, I said earlier, we need to make sure we're always finding throughout our life different areas of sin that we need to surrender to him in sanctification. But there's one more thing that we need to be doing at least, right? 
So I want to go back to the Great Commission, Matthew 28, right? You, we know this passage. Jesus said to them, oh, that's not it, sorry, Matthew 28. There it is. Jesus came and said to them, it's the disciples then, this is to you and I today if we're a Christian. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so, but the thing is, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore. Here's what's going on with the therefore. His authority is now our authority. Jesus' authority that he had, that he got given by the Father, now he's passing that authority on to every one of his followers, and that includes you and me today in this room. We have his authority. I want you to think about that just for a second. Let that soak in. I have King Jesus' authority in me. Okay? So does that mean that everything that a Christian says has King Jesus' authority in it. So students, this means that when you go to class this week, you can go to your teacher and say, by the authority within me which comes from Jesus, I command you to give me an A. That, that, that what you can do, okay? Or like employees, does this mean that we can go to our bosses and say, by the authority within me of King Jesus himself, I tell you, give me a raise. No. Not everything that we say is the authority of King Jesus. His authority that we now have in us and is only the authority we have is his words. His words. So Salvation Church, this is, this is the moment to make me proud. Where do we find King Jesus' words? In the Bible. In the Bible. That's where we find King Jesus' words, Right? So that's what we give with the authority that he's talking about here. Again, not everything I say, I'm also going to say this. It's not like if I have a certain throne called ex cathedra and I'm the Pope and now I'm sitting, now I'm the authority. No, nope, you don't see any of that in scripture. It's nowhere. The only authority, we have authority, but the only authority we have is the words of the king that he has preserved in the words of God in the Bible. So how does that play out? Let me, let me give you an example. Um, I was at a, a local philosophy club that I've told you guys about before. I've been to that multiple times. And one time I was there, uh, there was a few of us Christians and probably 12 to 15 non-Christians. So to kind of paint the scene that we are the minority in the room. And um, somehow, I don't remember now how we got there, but we got to the concept of the exclusivity of Jesus that, that the that we need to give your life to Jesus. If you don't give your life to Jesus, then there's this place called hell. And that's what we deserve to get by the wrath of God, the judgment that we're going to face. And, and so it, it, the tension in the room, some of you were there, you know, the tension of the room was growing. And so it, it finally gets to this place where there's a woman across the room. They've now identified, because I've explained, I'm like, I'm a pastor. So now I'm like in the crosshairs of, the, of their, you know, their weapons. Like, how dare you, pastors? And, um, and so this woman like finally says to me, she goes, all right, you tell me your opinion. Are you telling me that if someone doesn't believe in Jesus, that God's going to send them to hell? Okay, so that's what gets thrown at me. So here's a question. What would you say? What would you say? What would you do? Again, we're at a point when you could tell everybody's like all eyes are on you. You know that if you don't tell them what they want to hear, it's going to get crazy really fast. What would you say? So here's what I did. I said, well, oh. Uh, you know, I just remember my wife wants me to vacuum at home. I need to do that. I need to go. No, no, I did not do that. Here's what I said. I said, well, first of all, you need to understand, my opinion is absolutely irrelevant. You ask for my opinion. My opinion is nothing. Why? Because I have no authority in my opinion. I, I have nothing worthwhile to say. I mean, guys, let's just be humble and honest today. We're human beings. We use maybe 10% of our brain. Even if we could use all of our brain, we're not that smart. We live an average of 80 years. We're confined to one place one time. I mean, we are nothing. We don't know a lot, okay? And so there, we don't have any authority in and of ourselves. So I say that. I say, I, you know, well, my opinion doesn't matter. <clears throat> Instead, here's what I said. 
I said, I'm going to quote for you the words of Jesus himself from the Bible. And I just want to remind you, and the reason I did this is because I knew how I was going to go. But I said, I want to remind you, I'm just quoting Jesus' words. Okay? So if you don't like these words, you don't like Jesus of the Bible. Just remember that. <laughs> so I'm setting up. And then I said, okay, here's what Jesus said in John 8, uh, 24. Unless you believe, Jesus said, that I am he, that is the Messiah, God, that should be worshipped, you will surely die in your sins, which means you go to hell. And the room exploded. <laughs> How dare you? I mean, just going on and on and on. How dare you be so, so mean and so narrow-minded and bigoted, etc. But here's my thing, brothers and sisters in Christ. By the power of the Holy Spirit within me and understanding that when I'm quoting his words, I have nothing to be sheepish about. I have nothing to be apologetic about. I have nothing to be afraid really about that I, it's not my words. I didn't come up with this stuff. It's the king's words. I'm just the messenger. In fact, I don't really think about it. I told this the other day, right, to the group on the campus. You know, I was like, listen, look, I'm just a messenger. I understand, and, right? I quoted it. Jesus said, if you obey my teachings, that, that if some people obey my teachings, they'll obey yours also. But also Jesus said, if some people persecuted me, they'll persecute you also. If some people hated me, they're gonna hate you also. I told this group of unbelievers, I said, listen, I'm not gonna beat around the bush. This is what God says about all these subjects that you wanna ask me about. And, but they're the king's words. If you have a problem with it, it's not us you have the problem with. You have a problem with King Jesus. So here's the thing, guys, listen, we can either fight God in our pride, reject him like the Jewish religious leaders and a lot of the people of his day, and then we're going to face the judgment of God and receive hell rightfully so forever. God forbid that happens to you. Or instead, we can say, we are not God. We are not the king and queen of ourselves. We are, should be, and are going to be servants of the Lord. We are in his kingdom, whether we like it or not. And the key is, get this, we either now choose to bow the knee and confess Jesus is Lord and receive forgiveness of our sin, or if we die. And on our judgment day, do you realize, if we are in the wrong line and we never surrendered our life to Jesus Christ and gave him our life, he's going to say, you're a sinner. You're a rebel against me as king. You're going to hell where you belong. But before you go, you know what he's going to make everybody do? Bend the knee and confess him as Lord. And they're gonna hate it, but they're gonna be made to do it because he's God. And then they're gonna to go to hell where they rightfully deserve. But listen, listen, if you can hear my voice right now, you don't have to be in that line. You can get out. This is the good news. Give your life to Jesus. Humble yourself, please. Just like so many in this room have done and people around the world and through the ages, we're not better than anybody else. We are all rebels too. We deserve hell too. But we heard the good news. And God gave us the ability to be humble and to repent and to believe. And now we follow King Jesus. That was the second presentation of the gospel I didn't plan on, but there it was. Brothers and sisters, here's the last thing I want to say. Speak the word of God to people in your life with a humble confidence though. Speak the word of God with a humble confidence. Don't be ashamed to quote the word of God. Don't, don't beat around the bush. There's, man, there's so many pastors even today and Christians. They are so like, it's like they feel like they gotta make Jesus look good or something because you know, like, the, like Jesus needs a PR agent, you know, or, or like a, you know what I mean? Like don't, don't beat around the bush, man. Like some of you that were there on, on the other day at the campus, you know, like I'm just quoting the word. Listen, this is what, God, this is what the king says. And, and don't water it down. Don't be afraid, okay? Just say it in love with humility, but confident at the same time. So here's my last thing as we wrap up. How can we though speak the word with a bold, humble confidence if we don't know it, right? So we got to learn it. How do we learn it? Right here, sermons, come and hearing regularly, but not just here, reading the scriptures every day. Are we doing that? Uh, it, it's it's um, learning it 
Well, as we go to life group, we're learning the word. As we go to DX group, we're learning the word of God. We go to apologetics classes to learn the word of God. We go to youth group if you're youth to learn the word of God. We watch YouTube videos. We do all these things. We need to learn the word of God. Are we learning the word of God? Like I said earlier, I learn the word of God every day of my life. So continue to learn the word of God. But then here's the next thing. We got to make sure we're living it. Okay? You don't want to walk around knowing all the Bible and we got a big planks out of our eyes, something Jesus talked about, right? We got to be living the Word of God. So let's continue to be humble and living the Word of God. Then after we learn it, we're living it. Now we need to make sure we're memorizing the Word of God. I'm going to say this in love, but like, when's the last time that, that you memorized a verse? Can you quote that verse right now? Okay? So some of us, like, da, you know, there's been seasons in my life and I was memorizing 40 in one summer, and then I'm, re- I'm memorizing none for 40 days. Easy. You know what I mean? Like, so I just want to encourage you, if you're in that season where you're not writing the Word of God in your mind, in your heart, start doing it. Start with something small. I'll give you all sorts of ideas if you ask me. And then once we learn it, once we're living it, and now we're memorizing it, and we know it enough, now are we sharing it with other people with a humble confidence? So we're going to close up with this. Jesus is the King with all authority. We've learned about these. Worship team is going to come in and we're going to close in a song. I, I, I really love praying with people at the end. And so at, when we get ready to do the song here, there's going to be some of us in the front here. But here's the thing. If you want more boldness, come up and let us pray for you. And I, I'm telling you, you come up and be prayed for. I, I, you'll start seeing the Spirit of God giving you more boldness if that's what you want. If you are not a Christian, but you want to surrender your life to Jesus Christ, come up and let us lead you in prayer and you can give your life to Christ right now. If you're a Christian and you're like, you know what, there's an area of my life that I've been holding off. I want to surrender that to the King. Come up and let us pray for you. Finally, if you want to speak the word with a humble confidence and you want prayer that you would do that more in your life, let us pray for you. Okay, so worship team, we're going to let you go ahead and take it from here. Okay, guys? And if you want to be prayed for, come up on either side.